The camp is in a hilly area covered in thorny bushes and refuse. A quarter of the camp is underwater. Among the tents and cardboard and tarpaulin shelters is a church made of bits of plastic and wood. This is life in the jungle, the name given to this disused dump just five kilometers from Calais town centre. Around 4,000 refugees and migrants live here in appalling conditions. They have fled from Afghanistan, Syria, Eritrea or Sudan. Some have been here for months. While a few wait to get official documents, most go back and forth as they risk their lives attempting to cross to England. This young man from Sudan, who arrived here last week, explains. People, they are broken, their leg, they are injury. Some of them, they die because of a train. They don't know how to go there. That one I'm afraid, how can I, how can I pass there? If the police arrest me, maybe, maybe even they, they took me to Sudan, uh, that I'm afraid. Living conditions are very harsh and violence is rife in the camp. On the 10th of September, a Médecins Sans Frontières team started working with doctors of the world who have been running a clinic since June. It's going to be winter soon. We're seeing lots of respiratory infections, but there will be more and more, and lots of scabies because of lack of hygiene and overcrowding in the camp. There are injuries due to violence too, which is common here, disputes amongst themselves or with, let's say, the authorities. Sanitation is a disaster too. Opened by the French government last January to assemble in one place the refugees and migrants who had been gathering in the town, the camp has only 30 toilets and just three water points installed. The three refuse containers are not enough and there's no rubbish collection. A logistics team has launched a vast clean-up campaign. We've got a team handling sanitation in the camp, and they're setting up a waste management system. This requires informing communities and organizing a daily refuse collection. Waste management is a real problem in the camp. Several associations and many volunteers do what they can to help. Because here in Calais, France is in breach of its obligation to provide protection. The first cases of cholera were reported in a displaced persons camp in Nigerian town Maiduguri in mid-August. Overcrowding, poor living conditions and inadequate access to health care all contribute to the spread of this disease. Further cases of cholera were soon declared in two more camps. Most were from Goni Kachalari camp, where a water distribution point proved to be contaminated. By mid-September, official figures were 172 people infected and 16 dead. Working in cooperation with the local health authorities, Médecins Sans Frontières has deployed an emergency operation to combat the epidemic. Between 10th and 15th of September, 187 patients were admitted to the cholera treatment centre. Less severe cases are treated at oral rehydration points. Hygiene and sanitation programmes have also been set up by MSF. By early October, the number of cases of cholera in the displaced persons camps had fallen. This is the measles treatment centre in Malongo Hospital in Katanga. Sick children arrive here every day. They've all got measles, complicated by pneumonia, malaria or acute malnutrition. Measles has been raging in Katanga since March. Now almost endemic, it is very young children who are particularly at risk. Médecins Sans Frontières teams are currently supporting local health authorities in over 10 of the region's health districts. MSF is also carrying out vaccination campaigns, no small challenge in a region where villages can be very hard to reach. Another major challenge is alerting people to the importance of vaccination. The majority respond well to what MSF does. There are people who still have traditional beliefs, religious beliefs. 
On top of not getting their children vaccinated, they also refuse to take them to the treatment center. But when we reach out to them, it works. Since June, MSF has treated over 20,000 cases of measles and vaccinated more than 300,000. But human and financial resources are sadly lacking and more action is required urgently. There are three main reasons for setting up a vaccination campaign. When a country's routine immunisation process falls short, so-called catch-up vaccination. In response to an epidemic. Or to prevent an epidemic in emergency situations, population displacements for example. In this latter case, in say a refugee camp, vaccination is a priority as overcrowding, poor living conditions and limited access to healthcare are all factors that add to the risk of disease. But the barriers to setting up emergency vaccination campaigns are numerous. Security conditions may prevent teams getting to certain regions and people to vaccination sites. Procurement timelines can cause delay, vaccine manufacturing shortages for example. Authorization from local authorities can also pose a problem. Availability of reliable demographic and topographic data. Logistics, maintaining cold chain storage for the vaccines throughout transport to vaccination sites. And lastly, the high price of vaccines. The pneumococcal vaccine against pneumonia, for example, costs $7 a dose. Depending on a child's age, two or three doses are required, which can mean as much as $21. These barriers can have serious consequences. In South Sudan, MSF had to wait almost a year before finally being able to launch in August 2013 a vaccination campaign to protect children against pneumonia in Nida refugee camp. To overcome these barriers, progress needs to be made in the development of single-dose vaccines that are easy to administer and to produce heat-stable vaccines that don't require cold chain storage. The price of vaccines must be decreased too. MSF launched its A Fair Shot campaign in April 2015 and is calling to reduce the price of the pneumococcal vaccine against pneumonia from the current $21 to $5 per child. Dans la tête de tout le monde, ce que je crois, c'est que quand on est dans un hôpital, on se, on se dit tous que c'est le dernier endroit qui va être euh, préservé dans, dans une zone de guerre et que c'est là où on va recevoir des gens blessés de quelque bord qu'ils qu soient. Et sur cet épisode-là où tout le monde savait où était l'hôpital, où tout le monde connaissait la localisation de l'hôpital, à se dire que malgré tout, il a été bombardé, c'est quelque chose auquel on n'aurait jamais pensé. D'entendre les Américains parler de dommages collatéraux, ensuite euh, d'entendre euh, le, le porte-parole du gouvernement afghan euh, justifier, donc admettre qu'ils viennent de bombarder sciemment un hôpital euh, parce que pour eux c'était une cache euh, de combattants euh, talibans. Euh, donc là, ils admettent devant tout le monde qu'il y a un crime de guerre puisqu'ils savaient qu'il y avait des patients à l'intérieur, des médecins à l'intérieur. Ça, c'est quelque chose qu'on qu n'admet qu pas et qu'on n'acceptera pas d'entendre ce genre de choses euh, euh, sans, sans avoir vraiment euh, clairement euh, des explications sur ce qui s'est passé.